Hello, welcome friends to a new episode of The Healing Hour. Tonight's topic is going to be five health issues men shouldn't ignore. And we're very fortunate to have with us tonight, Dr. Mao, as well as um, J. Matthew Brand, who is the head of our Newport Beach clinic. So it's so exciting to have them both together because I know this is a topic dear to their hearts and dear to all of you do that are tuned into Men's Health. Um, just so you know, June is actually Men's Health Awareness Month. So that is why we chose this topic. So just to set up the background for you a bit, men are notorious for ignoring health issues and avoiding the doctor's office. I think we can all agree on that one. However, not all medical issues can be avoided easily. We know symptoms like shortness of breath or chest pain require immediate medical attention, but sometimes the signs aren't as apparent. For instance, you might have sleep challenges consistently. There may be persistent body pain. It may be you're experiencing slow urine stream, or perhaps you have frequent heartburn, and then there are those that actually undergo um, erectile dysfunction and many other types of topics. Now, we can't cover everything tonight, but we're going to tackle those top five that uh, continuously come in through the clinics as patient concerns. So tonight we're going to teach you about the symptoms of these five conditions and what you shouldn't overlook. The warning signs are there, but awareness is critical. Women can be a tremendous support too. So if we've got some females on tonight, great for you because you are the ones who are very vocal with your significant others regarding the necessity of yearly checkups and also to be watching out for those danger signs. Feeling healthy isn't the same as being healthy. Men interested in protecting their virility need to be vigilant and have a healthy lifestyle and embracing preventative healthy habits. So let us get things underway because we have a lot we want to cover with you tonight. We have Leah Jonas, our operations director. She is moderating on Facebook for those of you that are on Facebook. And I can see that there's several people on Zoom. Um, so just a couple of things for you to be aware of. If you are on Facebook and you have questions for Dr. Mao or Matthew, please write your questions into the comments box. Leah will be chatting with you all throughout the episode, but we love receiving your feedback. And during the last 15 minutes, we're going to hold all questions. In the last 15 minutes, you can ask your questions to either of them, and it can be regarding this topic or it can be other topics as well. Those of you that are on Zoom, you also have a feature. Unless you're calling in, then you won't be able to access this. But if you're on the video with us, the video circuit, then at the bottom of your menu, you have a Q&A box that you can tap on. It's an icon at the bottom, and you'll be able to write your questions in there. Okay, let's do this. Um, what I'd like to do, please, is, um, Dr. Mao, can we start with you? And I was mentioning before that June is Men's Health Month. It's a time to highlight awareness of healthy behaviors and preventable health issues. Can you give us an overview for what we're going to be covering tonight and why? Yes, uh, Tiffany. Um, first of all, yay for guys. We actually <laughs> I know this is your month. one time of the year. It's you know, all about you. <laughs> I mean, you know, every month. There's, there's this, there's that, you know, I mean, and, and, and of course, women, women's issues are like prevalent. So of course, and women are important. So you, you, you all get the attention, but at least once a year, guys get some attention, you're right? Because we do have problems and thank goodness for the women in our lives. Uh, you know, <laughs> we wouldn't be here. I mean, our mothers, you know, nagging over us for good reasons because mm -hmm. men tend to ignore all kinds of problems that come up. And I, myself included, you know, I think doctors can be the, the worst, worst patients because, you know, we, we tend to justify for everything we feel because we've seen it all and we go, oh, well, that's okay, that's okay. But, but it's very dangerous if you avoid uh, if you if you ignore somebody's uh, persistent symptoms, like what we're going to talk about today is, you know, uh, Tiffany already kind of mentioned and highlighted, uh, men have uh, you know prostate problems, right? This is a common issue. So uh, as you get older, for sure, we're all going to get it. So hey, you know what? Pay attention, right? Because you, if you don't want the rotor rooter treatment or you know more draconian measures, uh, let's start taking care of it now. Uh, what about all that pain? You, you know, you, you suffer with pain in parts of your body for years. And being macho, being, you know, not communicative, being uh, just not wanting to deal with it, you know, you could get yourself in big trouble. I mean, I, I tell you, I've seen it clinically, so has Matthew over the years. 
guys just ignore, ignore until they collapse, whether it's a massive heart attack or whether it's a colon cancer or, you know, something pretty serious that could have been caught early on, right? So don't ignore pain, right? Pain is your body telling you, hey, there's something going on here, some something wrong here. And then that sort of digestive problem, you know, guys tend to, of course, consume, uh, it, this is according to studies, but my experience rings true as well, personal experience, that guys just, you know, have more heartburn, burp more, and, you know, you got more gastric problems. And that's an issue, so we, we need to also uh, take care of that uh, as well, it's not to ignore. And then, you know, we talk all about menopause and hormonal health for women, fertility, reproductive system, and all of that. And sometimes we forget, like men, we're like 50% of the equation, right? If you want to make a baby, we've got to be included in this conversation. And I penned an article for this month in June newsletter uh, on, uh, you know, men's sperm quality and, and production. I mean, it's, Last 30 years, as long as they've been tracking, the male sperm production has gone down by 50%, and the quality is also down in the dumps. And so what can we do to uh, pay attention to that? And then the virility and the, the you know, erectile functions, all that. You know, yes, you know, this is, there's a whole market out there serving that. But what we're really talking about is is you know the health reasons of why uh, that you suffer from uh, you know, potency and virility issues and what you can do through common sense and Chinese medicine to help you restore the sexual vitality, right? So that's just as important. Um, anyway, there's, there's a few other things we'll be talking about. Of course, heart disease is you know, very, very common, uh, much more common in men than in women. So we need to emphasize some of the things that you know guys are more susceptible to um and and not the least risky behavior you know men are uh, very prone to risky behavior and what do they include they include driving fast and taking unnecessary risk uh and uh it's very funny i i have a friend who who has what they they so he once described guys as suicide machines it looks like you know we're constantly trying to kill ourselves but um, you know, if without, without the women in our lives that uh, basic slows down and say, hey, think before you jump, um, I, think, um, I think we would be, you know, decimated as a species. So anyway, that's it. <laughs> okay. So as I was saying, we have a lot to cover tonight. <laughs> um, Matthew, I'm going to turn over to you um, and I need you to unmute. Perfect. Okay, so when it comes to men's health, is there a yearly checklist that you like to recommend to your patients so that they stay on top of their health? How do you set this up for men? So it depends on how old they are. Um, and I just want to touch on one thing real quick that Dr. Mao said. I think what's re what really proves that men don't do well without a partner well into old age is that I think men, if you're single and you're old, you don't tend to live very long. Women, on the other hand, do just fine without us. So anyway, that said, <laughs> um, uh, so for younger men, uh, the big thing uh, that you need to be concerned about on top of everything else is checking your testicles for lumps. Mm -hmm. So that's something like women need to be checking their breasts for lumps on a regular basis. Men need to check their, their testicles. And young men tend to think that they're, you know, they're immortal. They're never going to die. They're just going to keep going strong. And they look, you know, the older they get, the sexier they get. That's kind of the mindset that you have. But the reality is the average age for testicular cancer is about 33 years old. Oh, wow. And so, um, so you really need to just check your testicles. And so for any men that are watching, very simply, if this is your testicle, just run your fingers over it. And if you have any lumps, go to see your doctor. Pretty simple, straightforward thing. Um, but then for us older guys, um, we need to, like Dr. Mao pointed out, we need to be concerned about our prostates. So once you start you know, you know, reaching like 40, 45, then you need to start looking at doing PSA tests. And while you know, it's not a marker for cancer per se, 
you're just kind of looking to see if it's at the level that it should be. So just on average, PSA levels for a 40 year old man is, you know, between 0.5 to 0.6 on average. For a 50 year old man, it's one. And then it goes up incrementally uh, every decade. Okay, and if, what does PSA stand for, for those of us that don't know? So it is, it stands for prostate specific antigen. So it's something, as the name implies, it is specific only to the prostate. Okay. And um, I've heard interviews with people where they kind of, they explain this very thoroughly, sort of where normally the prostate, the PSA is there, um, or the prostate is there to basically produce this in order to liquefy semen. Um, your plumbing, the older that you get, becomes weaker. Um, so the vasculature that's in there, the pipes, the piping just starts falling apart. So it's like the New York City sewer system, and it just starts falling apart a little bit as we get older. And so that starts leaking into the blood. And so when you do a blood test, you're looking at not overall blood PSA levels, but you're looking at how much is actually leaking out. And that can be either it's getting higher because you have, there is a cancer that's developing or alternately your prostate's just getting larger. And so that's something that happens for all men, you know, to varying degrees. We all as men may die with prostate cancer, but it may not necessarily be the cause of us dying. Um, so just to be specific, you can die at say like 100 years old and then they can do an autopsy and find that you have some cancer cells in there but it didn't cause you to die versus you have aggressive prostate cancer and that kills you. So, but it's something, to, you know, obviously it's something you wanna work with your doctor about just to kind of check on um, and it's, you know, just should be part of your normal physical. And then obviously when you get into being 50 or older, you want to look at a yearly basis doing what's called a digital rectal exam. So basically they're feeling to see what the size of the prostate is um, just to see that it's not getting too big too quick. And then, you know, and if, besides the big C, uh, the other things that you want to do, especially for men, is check your blood pressure, um, check your cholesterol, check your triglycerides. Um, you also want to see how well your body's dealing with uh, blood sugar. So you look at, you know, hemoglobin A1C tests, which is basically a, th a three month window to see how well your body is processing uh, blood sugar. And then there's fasting blood sugar. So those, those are the big things that we tend to, you know, advise people to do on top of all the other things that we just asked people about, because we're already checking for everything down the list. Mm -hmm. um, but it's always good to get, you know, extra blood tests and whatnot. Okay. Well, that's a really comprehensive checklist. So thank you for that. Sure. Uh, okay. Let's go into, uh, we said we were going to talk about five challenges today and we're circling back to some of the topics both of you already touched on. But the first thing I want to talk about because we hear so much about it is sleep challenges. So Dr. Mao, talk to us about what you find to be more prevalent in men in terms of sleep. Well, um, you know, I'm surprised that most women haven't divorced men by now because the snoring <laughs> keeps them up, you know, for most of their marriage and drives them nuts. There's no wonder, you know, I think uh, there are cases with, uh, you know, wives murdering their husband while they, <laughs> while they're asleep. I'm sorry, don't, 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 don't take that literally. That, that was just, you know, an, a, a, a an expression, although, you know, I, I, you know, I, I was thinking, uh, Matthew, that you have referred to this, the broken sewage pipes in New York. You gotta be careful. There are people tuning from New York that are going to be quite upset at you referring to the, <laughs> the, you know, the bad shape of the New York sewage system. It's probably true, but anyway. Um, so sleep, you know, sleep. Look, I mean, pee -pee, he, here's the thing, right? So, so guys snore. I mean, that, that's just a, a, a general theme. And the reason uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, mostly because of the fact that um, guys tend to be more overweight as you get older, especially that big belly that develops. So the, the beer belly. So you lie on your back and, you know, the, the, the perfect storm of the upper palate, the soft palate of your mouth, the roof of your mouth collapses and then the tongue falls back and it obstructs your airway. So that's called obstructive um, 
sleep apnea. And uh, so that's that's a big problem. Uh, and, and that, you know, you wake up multiple times from lack of breathing, uh, oxygen, lack of breathing. And uh, so that is most likely what happens with the, most guys. And this condition, sleep apnea, has been proven to be a high risk factor for uh, cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. Um, and um, heart, heart disease and diabetes have been talked about. Cancer, not so much. But you know, uh, one of the uh, causes of cancer among several uh, well-documented cases is low oxygen state or hypoxia. And so when you suffer chronically from lack of oxygen when you sleep at night, that is a, a opportunity for cancer cells to form. So anyway, those are some of the things. So, so sleep apnea is the issue. And then of course, there is the, uh, the, the stress. You know, guys don't communicate, guys don't share feelings. And so you go to bed and you bottle up and you're thinking all night, you're stressed, you're waking up from bad dreams or you just have a hard time falling asleep. So, you know, again, we have ways to help patients, uh, everything from, uh, you know, sort of um, using meditation, guided uh, meditation and imagery to help patients fall asleep. So we actually have a CD, um, or you can actually download online called Sleep. It's a sleep meditation. And um, I've had a lot of patients give me feedback that, you know, before that thing is over, within like two, three minutes, they, they're fast asleep. So they've never listened to the end of that, uh, which is fine. Uh, we also use uh, herbs, uh, you know, regularly to help people sleep. Just, it just calms the mind down. And uh, some of the active ingredients that we find very helpful is uh, this uh, jujube dates, uh, which some of you may have grown up with. It's very popular in the South. These are dates that are called jujube. And, uh, and the seeds of that date is very powerful as a calming agent. No side effects, calms you and helps you fall asleep. And so we have it in, uh, you know, in our sleep remedy. And uh, so people take, take it, uh, no side effects, non-addictive, and uh, it does help sleep without the drowsy effects. And of course, uh, one other thing, if you have sleep apnea, you need to see a spe sleep specialist to either be outfitted with a CPAP, which is a breathing apparatus, or get a dental splint that will pull your chin forward and you know keep the back of the throat open. So. Okay, great, thank you. And Matthew, what tips do you have in regards to sleep challenges? Well, here you took a couple of mine, but I, I do want to, I do want to actually add, uh, add the importance of what, uh, what Dr. Mao said. There's actually, you know, especially with regards to um, the, the higher risk of cancer, if you're not, if you're not getting enough oxygen, there's also a lot, I mean, there's a lot of really good research that points towards not getting enough sleep. So it's not just sweet sleep quality, it's also quantity that allows your immune system to function properly. And what that does when you don't get enough sleep, and this can happen as quickly as one night of not, not having enough sleep can lower the amount of natural killer cells that you have in your system. And if you're talking about many years of getting you know, chronically you know, four or five hours of sleep because you're stressed, you're working too hard, you're trying to support everybody in your family, um, that actually increases your risk of getting cancer by a lot. Um, the thing that sometimes people tend to do in order to make up for that is that they end up having a reliance upon sleeping pills. And I want to emphasize that our sleep, um, you know, products like our natural products are not sleeping pills per se. Mm -hmm. So in other words, they're not going to knock you out. They're not going to put you in, in, into an unconscious state. They're actually going to relax you and allow you to get into a natural state of relaxation, mm -hmm. as well as using meditation, which Actually, if you look at like the National Sleep Foundation, they fully back meditation as a way of supporting you being able to fall asleep properly. But going back to the problem with sleeping pills is that it doesn't actually give you a natural sleep cycle. And because of that, you aren't supporting your immune system the way you should. You're not supporting yourself emotionally. 
and you're not giving, you're not able to go through that regeneration that your body really needs, not just mentally, but also physically. And so trying to find natural ways to actually get to that stage of being able to, you know, have a full sleep is really helpful. And then there's like a whole, you know, other list of things that we can go through, you know, having good sleep hygiene, um, which I think people are pretty, should be aware of. So in other words, you only use your bed in your bedroom for sleep and intimacy. You don't use it to sit there and look at your phone, you know, obsessing over emails, because then what you do is you associate that location with being stressed, with thinking about work. Um, you also want to make sure if you're up in the middle of the night that you get up and you leave the bedroom and come back once you have that sleep pressure again. You also don't want to rely too much upon caffeine because caffeine is what it does is that it takes away this chemical that we build up throughout the day that gives, gives us sleep pressure called adenosine. Mm -hmm. We're getting technical here, but anytime you have some coffee in the morning, okay, coffee, tea in the morning, that's fine. Once you start getting into midday, you've got to cut that out because then you're actually taking that chemical out of your system and you're not allowing yourself to build up that sleep pressure that will eventually make you want to go to sleep in the evening. Um, then there's the other thing that I think we're all pretty aware of, because again, going back to phones, to tablets, to all these blue light emit emitting um, LED uh, devices that we have, you got to stay away from that for about you know an hour or so before wanting to go to bed. Otherwise, you're constantly telling yourself, hey, it's daytime, I got to stay up. Mm -hmm. um, and then... I think that's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a few, but yeah, I mean, I definitely, I can't emphasize enough, like trying to find some natural, natural ways of getting a full night's sleep versus trying to find, you know, some kind of uh, quick fix. Right. And I like it because you're looking in the long term for the individual, how best to support them instead of, as you say, that quick fix that right. is so momentary, then the next week you're struggling again. Okay. Exactly. Let's, um, let's transition from there to body pain because they kind of go hand in hand in my world. Um, let's, Dr. Mel, why don't you talk about how persistent body pain can lead to more serious conditions? And could you share some examples with us too, please? Sure. Uh, you know, so the, um, well, there's, you know, again, pain, pain is a signal, right? So when the body gives you pain, it's telling you there's something going on. There's a, there's a blockage, literal blockage of either blood vessel or signal blockage where the nerve uh, is inflamed. And, and so the signal is, is, is really accentuated. Um, or there's something else going on, you know, maybe referred from somewhere. And uh, so uh, I, will, I will give you some examples. I mean, you know, that patients with back pain. And I'm not talking about lower back pain. I'm talking about like middle to shoulder blade back pain. Mm -hmm. So this patient who uh, thought maybe because he's a tennis player. And so he, you know, he's a right-handed tennis player. So he, he plays really hard. He serves really hard and he thinks he tweaked his back. Anyway, so this goes on for a year, right? He goes to massage therapist, goes to physical therapist. He goes to the orthopedic guy, they prescribe him pills and they say, oh, just stretch it out and be careful. You know, lie on a tennis ball, roll on it, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like a pretty pinpoint right there in the back. And so when he came to see me, he's already had a pain for a year or so. And uh, so, I, uh, so I asked him, I said, okay, so well, tell me, um, what makes this pain worse besides playing tennis, right? And he says, well, <laughs> he says, when I go and, uh, you know, I don't do this often, but when I go to McDonald's and I eat lots of French fries and, you know, it's, and then it hurts more. <laughs> so it, it was a clue for me. I thought, well, so do you burp a lot and belch a lot after? So he says, yeah, I belch like crazy. My wife thinks I'm like, you know, she, she thinks I'm very uncouth. Mm -hmm. I said, well, yeah, it's not cool to belch in, you know, in public in front, in front of, uh, you know, ladies. Um, so, and I said, well, do you get nausea? He said, yeah, I feel nausea sometimes. I wake up in the morning, but I think that's just reflux, you know, acid reflux. Maybe it's the alcohol I drink. 
So you know what, we better scan your gallbladder because I'm not liking the sound of this. So we scan his gallbladder besides discovering that he has gallstones and inflammation in his gallbladder. It turns out he has a tumor in his bile duct. And so poor guy, I mean, you know, anyway, went to oncology, you know, get diagnosed with gallbladder uh, duct cancer as well as cancer in the gallbladder. Anyway, so again, something like this, when the first sign showed up, probably was, you know, was probably very small, very minor, probably could have been taken care of, but he just didn't jump on it. You know, it just kind of ignored it a little bit. Um, so this is something that is probably a little more extreme, but it can happen to people. I mean, look, if you have persistent headaches, you know, could it be an aneurysm? Could it be a um, brain tumor? These are kind of things you really need to take care of and not ignore, right? Get a diagnostic imaging if you need to, if you have persistent headaches. Um, but talking about back, you know, there's a lot of people with uh, back problems. It's one of the most common conditions, this is one of the reasons why Dr. Albert and I wrote this book called Back to Health and uh, back to pain-free health. And, and then we, we have a program to help people rehabilitate from their chronic back pain that has been, you know, sort of confirmed that it's a structural or muscular condition. But have we ruled out that you don't have a kidney disease or kidney stones? Have we ruled out that you don't have, you know, as Dr. Matthew pointed out earlier, testicular pain can, you know, you can have referred pain to the back as well, back pain. Uh, have we ruled out all these other things? So, so in our, you know, the way we practice Chinese medicine is that when someone comes in and they've got persistent conditions, symptoms, we will send them for diagnostics because it's not, it's not normal to have persistent symptoms after a period of time that doesn't get resolved. And so we're, we're very careful. We, we really try to counsel our patients on, you know, persistent pain. And uh, so that's, these are some of the, you know, more uh, the examples that I, that, that comes up. I mean, I, you know, I recently saw someone who had, you know, abdominal pain for a year and, um, you know, and I was just amazed that nobody, you know, and he, he's ignored it, he ignored it for a long time. And it turned out to be, um, you know, colon cancer and um, when they did find it. So it's like, you know what, it, you know, if in the beginning, if you had taken care of it and diagno diagnosed it now, it would not have gone out of the colon into the liver and other parts of the body. So it's, it's you know, we're not immortal and, and we are actually quite fragile, even though the human body is very resilient. But I, I'm, I'm here to say, you know, guys don't ignore Right? When you're in pain, you don't have to be macho about it. It's like, don't ignore it. His body trying to tell you there's something wrong and take care of it. So anyway. Okay, thank you. Um, Matthew, I wanna go more into, Dr. Mao had touched on one type of, of um, example when it comes to you know, experiencing heartburn and acid reflux. What about, in your opinion, what have you seen as examples and also any other warning signs that you've seen that men should be aware of? Uh, with regards to um, heartburn? Yeah, let's talk about heartburn and reflux first. Okay. And, then, um, and then if there's anything you want to add on to what Dr. Mao was just discussing, then by all means, we can talk about that too. Oh, sure. Um, well, I mean, just kind of building on what uh, Dr. Mao has said. I mean, yeah, but what men tend to do is we tend to ignore things because we think that, yeah, it, it doesn't, it's not going to affect us. And I don't think it's necessarily just unique to men, but definitely men are worse at it uh, mm -hmm. than women. Um, and trying to become aware of your body is also something that men don't want to do. Um, we just kind of have our task at hand and we just want to get it done. Um, but if you start paying attention to yourself um, and your body and get in touch with your body, which you know for men, this is kind of an uncomfortable thing to do, if you just calm down and realize that that's okay, you're still as manly as you need to be while doing that, um, then you'll actually be able to notice when things are off a little bit more. Um, so 
I think in Chinese medicine, we have what's called like a 10 asking song, you know, that we traditionally kind of go through if um, we're just kind of finding out their whole history and trying to find out what's going on with them. And I think it's actually a good guideline to, you know, do on yourself, you know, so a few of them include, you know, seeing whether or not you're intolerant to temperature, like is your temperature gauge off? Are you hot when people are, other people are cold or vice versa? Are you cold when people are warm? Um, are you sweating more than normal? Um, like, are you sweating in the middle of the night? Are you sweating at other unusual times when you're not exercising? Um, do you suddenly have pain that wasn't there beforehand? Um, yes, sometimes that can be like, if you're physically active, that obviously that can be due to something like playing tennis, but sometimes it's something else. Um, do you, are you going to the bathroom differently? Like, are your bowel habits a little different? Um, are you not able to hold your urine as much? In other words, are you incontinent? Um, or is it really difficult to go to the bathroom? Um, or has your appetite changed? Are you suddenly really thirsty? Um, Cause these can be signs of other things like, you know, diabetes onset. Like if you're peeing a lot more than you were and you're suddenly really thirsty, um, those are, you know, diabetic type symptoms. Um, and then is your sleep off? So just kind of going through this, this general list on a weekly basis to kind of take note of what's going on, I think is helpful. But again, because a lot of guys don't necessarily want to take stock or admit that things may be wrong, luckily we have technology to kind of step in and kind of help us with that. So thanks to Drs. Mao and Dow, I got one of these guys. So this is a Fitbit. Um, oh, so. Okay. So yeah, so this is our Christmas gift last year. So thank you. Um, but it allows us to kind of check to see, um, you know, how active am I being on a certain day? And I, and it's, you know, obviously it's not perfect. It's based on being a pedometer. Um, you know, obviously there's a variety of different options that are out there like the Apple watch and whatnot. Um, and then it allows me to check my sleep. Am I actually sleeping as well as I think I am? And I used to think, Oh, I'm fine. I'm getting, you know, seven, eight hours of sleep a night. No, I'm actually moving around a lot at night and I'm only getting about between six and seven hours of sleep a night. So that's what I found using this guy. So it becomes, a, if I'm not able to take stop because I'm too busy thinking about other things, I can then hook this up to my phone and then take stock of how I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, a, that's a good place to start in general. Uh -huh. um, but if we're gonna get into heartburn, so, Moving on from there, um, obviously a lot of men have heartburn. And one of the things that we see is that men don't, again, we don't take care of ourselves. And so we think that we can continue to eat as many cheeseburgers as we want. in and out and Burger King are our best friends and no one's gonna tell us otherwise, but you continue to do that and that's gonna start causing some, some GI upset. The other thing that we tend to see where people are, um, you know, eating things that are improper, and that includes other types of fatty foods, an excessive amount of dairy, an excessive amount of spicy foods, um, or they're drinking too much. So that's the other thing is that, you know, guys do like to drink. It becomes, you know, the nighttime cocktail to relax after a hard day's work. And that's going to cause everything to really come up okay. where it shouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And I've definitely encountered like other men that have come into my office that straight up say, I don't like vegetables. I don't want to eat them. I don't understand these men, but still they, this is common enough where guys don't like, they don't like to cook and they don't like vegetables. Um, so that's a big problem. You're not having a balanced diet and you're also making sure that the microbiome that you have in your gut is pretty terrible. Um, and that's going to, you know, aggravate things there. And then there's the other thing that happened. Anti, anti vegetables. What do you tell him to do in that case? If he's just straight out, I am not going to take vegetables. Give me another solution. What would you give him as a solution? Well, I tell, I ask him how much he likes his life <laughs> because eating well, vegetables, it's, yeah, it's not really a, a question. It's, uh, it's not, it's not a matter for debate because, I think what people tend to like to do with us practitioners is that they come in and they think that they can negotiate with us so that their body can be better. And you have to make it clear that we're not 
we didn't make up the rules. <laughs> we didn't, we didn't say, Oh, the, your body's going to be like this and this is how to take care of it. No, it's just, this is what we've discovered from, you know, recent science and also thousands of years of Chinese medicine. You know, this is what we know to be true. And if you're not going to do this for yourself, then, then you're going to die a lot sooner than you'd like. So, so it's, it's tough kind of having that conversation, but I think that's kind of what it comes down to. Okay. Well, if I may interject a little bit, you know, the, uh, it's true that they have to make a choice. Like, you know, they, you have for a balanced diet for prevention of uh, disease. Vegetables is very much part of the repertoire. Uh, but it's also true that most people are turned off of vegetables because the way that they grew up, and their mothers have really wrecked their appetite for vegetables. I mean, it's just, first of all, if you kill the vegetables, it has no taste. Mm -hmm. And so who, want, who wants to eat that, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I do is I, I start them easy. I go, hey, you know what? I got a couple of recipes here from my, my cookbook called Secrets of Longevity Cookbook. Mm -hmm. And all right, this is an easy way to get into vegetables, puree soups. You don't even, you don't have to taste, you chew on the vegetables, like, you know, a puree uh, broccoli soup. But instead of using, uh, you know, milk, dairy or cream or something like that, we use coconut milk. Uh, we use almond milk and you, you do a puree soup and you spice it correctly. Now I just got vegetables like broccoli into someone's stomach without objection. So. I think sometimes we just also need to be creative. We need to have eaten vegetables that you go, oh my God, I've missed this my whole life. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I, I'm lucky because I grew up in, in, in Asia. And so vegetables is just so good. It tastes mm -hmm. so good. There's like 101 ways to make uh, spinach taste fabulous, you know? And so um, anyway, so I, I think it's a combination of basically saying, hey, you got to make a choice. And now let's, kind of get you into it by exposing you to some really good tasting stuff. So anyway, just a, 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 a FYI. Okay. That's really good advice. Thank you. Thank you to you both. Um, I, I do have a question because it's a question that we get um, periodically is anti-acids, the type that are available over the counter. Are there side effects that can occur from overusing anti-acids, over the counter anti-acids? There definitely are side effects. First of all, these, uh, well, there's over the counter and then there's prescription. And these are like top sellers, okay? If we look at the top 10 drugs in America, uh, the top three are basically an acid, you know, acid blockers. They're called PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. So they prevent uh, the production of the gastric juice, this acid that you know, the stomach produces. And uh, so, okay, so you solve this acid issue, but you really don't solve the problem. And over time, there have been some side effects with PPI, long-term use of PPIs. And they include things like, uh, you know, malabsorption of uh, calcium, magnesium, and critical minerals that can impact bone health. So for women, this is very bad news. If you're on a, a acid blocker PPI and you got osteoporosis, well, there's, there's the reason, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there are also these, some of these minerals, you know, we're talking about minerals, trace minerals that are critical for brain function. So we're seeing some studies linking long-term use of PPIs to uh, early onset of dementia. I mean, that's scary. So, you know, things like that, we should be careful. We also need to be aware that if you block the acid, all the bacteria and microbes go right through. And now you've got, you know, unfriendly bacteria in your gut that's causing bloating gas and you know maybe even inflammation and mm -hmm. so that could all result because you block the acid and um, so the over-the-counter stuff uh, works okay work doesn't work very well and uh, truly in order to overcome uh, heartburn besides making dietary changes of getting rid, rid of rich foods and alcohols and the acidic foods like coffee and tomato and deep fry and spicy food. I know, I know, you're starting to go, oh my God, what else is there to eat? I know. Uh, there's a lot, right? I know, I know, there's a lot of things to eat, but here's the thing. What we discover is that the reason why people's stomach produce too much acid is either they have a bacterial infection, such as H. pylori, which is a common bacteria, 
And we have Chinese herbs that can knock it out. Uh, for example, a Chinese herb called coptitis, sometimes called um, golden thread. Uh, it's, um, it, it contains uh, berberine, which is a natural antibacterial uh, ingredient that can wipe out H. pylori and other kind of bacteria. So that's one example. Uh, the other reasons why uh, people have heartburn is because they don't have enough enzyme, digestive enzyme. So then the body's compensating by producing more acid. Well, so let's get more enzyme into your, in, into your diet. For example, papaya, pineapple contain two very critical enzymes that can help you digest. But we also sometimes will use plant-based enzyme in a pill. Um, and, and that will help. Uh, so we have a plant-based one called phytoenzyme that can really help break down uh, starch, so amylase, uh, protease will break down protein, and lipase will break down fats, and other kind of enzymes that will help with digestion. So once we give patients an enzyme formula, voila, the acid goes down on its own. There's no longer any, any hyperacidity. Now, there's a good reason why we should actually be watching out for a chronic heartburn because people, guys especially, pay attention, chronic heartburn can cause esophagitis. And chronic esophagitis, this inflammation esophagus, can lead to something called Barrett's disease. Barrett's disease is a pre-cancer of the esophagus. And that's, that's terrible. I mean, you don't want to get this, okay? Uh, the treatment is horrendous. And I have to go in and surgically remove part of your esophagus in your stomach, and then you've got to go to, through chemo, and then now you're, you know, you, you're being fed through a tube. I mean, trust me, you don't want to get this. So take care of the heartburn. Don't ignore it, okay? Chronic heartburn can lead to Barrett's esophagus, which can lead to a cancer condition. So um, anyway... These are just some of the, uh, the, the repercussions that, you know, if you ignore something, it's going to come back and bite you big time. Okay. Good to know. You're scaring us with cancer. <laughs> we don't want it. <laughs> um, okay. Let us, let's switch gears a little bit here. Um, at the very beginning of the episode, we were talking about weak urine flow. Matthew, can you address that? Tell us what urine hesitancy is exactly and what we can do to over, I, can you overcome it? Or is whatever it is that we can do with our bodies. Sorry, guys, I don't relate to that one. So guide them <laughs> in along on what to do on this topic. <laughs> I actually, before that, you know, women do have dysuria. I mean, a lot of women come in with pelvic floor spasm or bladder spasm, urethral spasm that cause them to have difficulty with urination. So anyway, but, but today is all about the guys. So we're all not going to get into the women. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Go ahead, Matthew. No, it's okay. Yeah. We'll cover it the rest of the year. So <laughs> we get our month, <laughs> we get our day anyway. Exactly. Um, we're all about pelvic floors again in women. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, obviously, I mean, men also need to be concerned about pelvic floors as well. I mean, it's, it's not something that men all, you know, like to think about very much, but we still have to be concerned about that. But that's neither here nor there. We're talking about, you know, urinary hesitancy, which is usually due to the prostate getting bigger. So what happens is, you know, the, the two, one of the tubes, the urethra is going to go pass through where the prostate is. And if that thing starts getting bigger, then it's going to squeeze that urethra and it's going to cause us to have issues peeing. You're going to have that urgency to be able to urinate, but it's going to be really hard to actually go. Um, and so that's not something that you want to ignore. Um, it's something that if it's like early enough, we actually have a pretty great formula. Um, the acronym for it right now is, uh, escapes me. Dr. Mao, of course, knows it, but I know it's something that we use and it basically helps restore blood flow to the area, to that pelvic floor area and to the prostate. And, you know, that should actually facilitate, um, you know, you being able to go to the bathroom pretty regularly and it works almost immediately. It's fantastic. Um, but it's something that, you know, it, obviously if it persists, you need to, you know, follow up with your doctor um, and see if that prostate getting bigger is benign, you know, um, if it's something called BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia, um, or if um, it's actually cancerous. Okay. 
Um, do we, can we say what this product is just so that our audience is aware? Is it something that has to be by prescription in the clinic or is it over the counter? Oh, yeah, no, no. We, we, well, I mean, we, we have a, um, we do have uh, two, two supplements. You know, one is called Prostate Support and which has uh, mm. some, of the, some of these, um, you know, um, salt palmetto and a few other herbs as well as uh, vitamins that are very, very effective. Okay. And, um, yeah, so, you know, I think that's something that, that we do um, make available to people, you know, without prescription. So that's something to look at. Um, we also have, uh, and, and this gets into the other area, it's really interesting that um, the two types of testosterone that men produces. So, so here's what happens. And I, I think, as, you know, I don't know if I want to jump into this yet. Uh, Tiffany, you can tell me because what yeah. I'm about to what I'm about to talk about actually affects two areas: the hair uh -huh. and erectile. Okay. Well, that actually right. that go for it because um, that was our last topic we were going to talk about was erectile dysfunction, and we have a question from one of our attendees where they wanted to know about hair loss and and what causes that. So. Uh, well, okay, that that's perfect. All right. So if we look at uh, so men's health, right? So, so you, you you know so you're going through your adolescence. What comes in? Testosterone, right? So that gives you your drive, your libido, your muscles, and um, so that you know sort of what that that's the masculine trait. This this testosterone, uh, but there are different types of testosterone. And uh, so for the layman's term, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just call two types of testosterone. One is the good testosterone, which gives you the muscle strength and the muscle mass um, and, uh, and the courage and all of that. Uh, and the libido, the healthy libido. And then there is something called DHT. And the DHT is often called uh, not such a good testosterone because it can actually cause hair loss. So this is the type of testosterone that creates this kind of male balding pattern, uh, thinning of the hair and the migration of your hairline going back. And uh, so, so the DHT is the subject uh, to of of uh, you know common drugs on the marketplace. Like for example, Rogaine. Rogaine is a common uh, thing that you can buy in the drugstore, and it actually blocks the DHT. So you put that on your scalp. You know, it's a topical, and that can help if you if your hair loss is due to DHT. Uh, this this bad testosterone that's excessive. The problem is as you get older, right? The good testosterone declines, and that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons that leads to prostate actually swelling up, getting bigger, and, uh, and lowering of your, your erectile function, your libido and all of that, and your muscle strength and all of the good positive aspects of testosterone. And the bad aspects of test, uh, the DHT is emphasized because that level goes up, and that level will then cause you to experience hair loss it will cause mm -hmm. you to have more body hair. So, the, so, you know, when you start to see like, you know, your beard's getting thicker now, if you don't shave, the five o'clock shadow is, is actually 1 p.m. shadow. It's like, mm -hmm. well, what happened? I, I shaved this morning. Right. Uh, five hours ago, I got this shadow. And, you know, and, and guys, you're gonna laugh at this. Your nose hair and your ear hair yeah. just yes. grows <laughs> like crazy. And you're like, <laughs> what happened? I mean, you know, the hair that I don't want is like coming out big time and the hair that I want is gone. So, so this is the, this is the, 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 uh, the comedy of men's health and aging for guys. And so what we, so in Chinese medicine, we've recognized this problem and we say, okay, how do we, how do we maintain good testosterone, right? While decrease the DHT type of thing. And, uh, so there are natural herbs that can actually help stimulate your own production. We don't actually recommend taking testosterone because there are side effects that you have to watch out for, including uh, slight, you know, slightly increased risk for uh, stroke, heart, heart disease, and possibly even cancer. So the, the, the first thing I'm talking about is this product called Spark Male. 
And uh, so we have, you know, herbs in here that, uh, for example, Morinda, which is a, you know, a, 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 an herb that's probably more popular today. Um, and uh, it's otherwise known as noni. You know, so people know about noni. It's, it's Morinda root, actually. Uh, it's an antioxidant, but it's also an herb that gently stimulates your good testosterone while suppressing the bad testosterone. Um, and we have other herbs in here in a combination that really helps with uh, libido, with uh, erectile function, while at the same time begin to rebalance this, this, uh, you know, this ratio of DHT to good testosterone. And so that can be very helpful. We also have a, a uh, herbal formula uh, for hair called Hair Nurture. And there are specific hair in uh, specific hair, specific <laughs> herb in here that specifically helps with nourishing hair follicles and, and help increase blood flow uh, to increase hair growth. And uh, I can tell you a lot of people actually swear by this thing because it really does help thicken and grow it's their hair. So, continuously yeah and and you know one of the one of the uh things that it does do is to actually help to rebalance that ratio of that testosterone so kind of suppress the dht um mm -hmm. that's so undesirable and and you know there are drugs that actually suppress uh dht that you take orally as well uh and and sometimes uh you know you know urologists will prescribe it to shrink uh, the uh, B BPH, you know, the prostate swelling, mm -hmm. okay? But the side effect that is that people will begin to experience um, erectile dysfunction. This is a one of the side effects because when you're blocking, you're blocking the good testosterone as well as the bad one too. And so that's another undesirable um, effect of, of these, these types of drugs. So, you know, finasteride, for example, is one of the, uh, the, the names of the drugs, but there's a, uh, there's a number of them under different names. And so you, you need to kind of really understand the mechanism of why you're losing hair and, you know, and, and, uh, and having hair growing out of your nose and your ears. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very distressing thing. And then you're also, you know, finding your libido and your, you know, the sort of male sexual energy being impacted. And that's really distressing. You know, because we talk about women's libido, we talk about women's sexual dysfunction yeah. all the time in, in the context of the hormonal change, right? Menopausal and, and beyond. Well, men get andropause, you know, so this is the male version of menopause uh, that we go through. And uh, it's really important to take care of it because if you don't, uh, rapid aging onsets, and that's, a, that's really not, not necessary, you know? I mean, the one thing I want people to really remember is that getting older is inevitable, but aging is not. And we see plenty of that. And this is, again, after you know, years of research in the area of longevity and anti-aging, I've determined that is absolutely not necessary to age, okay. if you know what to do. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, I am looking at the time. We have questions from those in the audience. So how about if we tune over into that because it may be some more of the things that you were both planning to cover and then we can wrap up at the very end. Um, for those of you that are on uh, both Facebook Live as well as on Zoom, this is your opportunity. So please put your questions into the chat boxes. We're more than happy to answer that. And again, it can relate to tonight's topic or just if you have general medical questions that you would like to ask us. Um, for those on Zoom, you use the Q&A chat. Uh, Matthew, would you mind to start with us? And uh, the question I have for you is, do you have any recommendations for pre-diabetic men um, that are helpful for reversing this? Sure. Um, so first and foremost, um, you need to look at regular daily exercise. Um, that is very, very important. Um, and then there's sleep. So we talked about sleep earlier on, but you know, insulin, uh, insulin resistance becomes a problem um, the less sleep that you get. So we'd already talked about the, that being an issue for men. And so either because of not being able to sleep because of sleep apnea 
or you're stressed or you're drinking too much alcohol, regardless of that, you have to, you know, try to remedy that as best as you can. And it can be, like I said before, it can be psychological. And there's one thing that I kind of forgot to mention with that psychological component, Mm -hmm. we do have our essential oils. And I think say what you will about how effective they are in doing this and that and whether or not they're panacea, but they definitely create a psychological environment of being comfortable and safe. And so that can allow you to have that environment to be able to sleep much better. And then last but not least, there's, there's diet. I mean, diet is the surefire way to, you know, if you change that, that is going to make sure that you're, you know, going to avoid going full blown type two diabetes, you know, and again, you have to make those changes. When we were talking earlier on, you know, Dr. Mao had some fantastic, you know, solutions in terms of getting people to eat vegetables. The thing that I actually do tell my patients, which I kind of forgot at the time is, is I tend to think of like the rice bowl is the, 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 one of the easiest things to introduce people into getting vegetables where you have, obviously your, you have your grain, you have really small cut pieces of vegetables and you can put as much as you want and you can have, you know, meat or tofu or whatever and then as some kind of sauce where you're kind of hiding it in there, kind of like Dr. Mao's suggestion to be able to get those vegetables in. Um, so, yeah. Okay. I don't know why anybody would want to hide it. I mean, let's try a little <laughs> stir fry, you know, uh, spinach with garlic and black bean sauce. I mean, that's just, it's just delicious on, on its own. Why, why would you want to hide it? I mean, it's, I mean, it's, you know, anyway, but, but diet, we're talking about diet, right? Because listen, uh, you know, sort of eat more vegetables, right? And eat more whole grains and lean protein, but get rid of the sugar, get rid of the cookies and the ice cream and all that. That's just simply not good for you. Get rid of dairy because cow dairy has a lot of sugar, lactose. So you remove all that from your diet and suddenly you begin to see that blood sugar start to go down. Um, but, you know, before, you know, from a clinical standpoint of view, Corey, what we do use, we use um, berberine. We actually have a product called berberine with a little pepperine, which is an extract from pepper that's been shown to, you know, lower insulin resistance and help improve the overall uh, blood sugar profile. So something to, to, to look for. Uh, oh, that's anyway, great. For that's insulin clinic. resistance. Yeah. Okay. Um, Dr. Mao, next question for you. Um, head pain at the front of the head, like before bedtime, maybe that ties back into what you both were just talking about feeling, I'm assuming like stress headache at the front. So if it's a, you know, if it's frontal headache, you know, we have to differentiate, is it is eye strain? <laughs> You've been looking at that little iPhone. Uh-huh. I actually, you know, I, I, for three days, I'll give you my experience for three days last weekend. I was looking, I was reading this legal document, 100 page legal document. I don't know what I was thinking about. I'm looking, looking through it on my phone. And then Monday morning or Monday afternoon, I, I, I look in my eye and I bursted a blood vessel. I'm like, what oh, the? Wow. Well, I mean, that's what happens, right? I'm straining. So what? I realized, okay, okay, so I got to stop that. So maybe for, for whoever asked, this question like you're straining your eye like stop doing that all right i mean wear glasses or like forget looking at the little phone i mean look at it on your computer or right. you know i mean bigger type you know it's like my kids laugh at me all the time i have big types on my phone mm-hmm. hey guys i'll be able to see when i'm 90 years old and you all have to have your surgery whatever it's fine Okay, I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll have the last laugh at you, right? So I have big types, big deal. So, um, but eye strain, maybe you have sinus pressure or you just have a lot of, um, you know, eye strain. So what I do is I take one of this tension release aromatherapy and then I just roll it on my, my forehead here. I smell it and I rub it on my bottom of my feet and then mm-hmm. it gets rid of my pain. So. Anyway, but if you have this pain continuously for a few weeks without fail, please, by all means, go see a doctor, okay? Because there might be something else. But if it's just an occasional thing, you can take care of it. Simple. Okay, got it. So, um, Matthew, it's funny that Mal just re- mentioned the feet because that's the next question. Um, painful feet often. 
Is that specific to men, do you think? And what recommendations do you have? Well, I wouldn't say that it's specific. I mean, unless, you know, you're a man that has a lot of temper tantrums and you're stomping your feet a lot. Um, <laughs> I mean, they're definitely those. But no, I mean, I think um, it is it, I mean, it depends on the type of pain that they're getting. Like, is it neuropathy that you're getting in, in the bottom of your feet? What's um, and so neuropathy is where the, the nerves are actually damaged and it could actually be because of diabetes. Um, or, you know, or some other cause that's basically damaged the nerves and you're getting kind of this, um, this tingling sensation or even kind of this electric shock kind of sensation at the bottom of your foot. Um, if it's something else, then, you know, then it could be something more structural like, you know, bursitis. Um, so there's, there are these things called bursa. They're just kind of like these little water balloons. Um, at the bottom of your feet, you have them all over your body, but sometimes people get them if they're running a lot, and then that becomes inflamed, and then that causes pain. Um, so runners get that a lot. Um, there's also, you know, people have bunions, sometimes that causes pain, but that would be pretty obvious. Uh, sometimes people get something called plantar fasciitis, but this is not specific to, to men. Um, and it's definitely something that we would have to, you know, talk to them about, see them for. Okay. So that's really something where they should visit the clinic to be able to. Oh, yeah. And Absolutely. again, we do see quite a few patients with that. So I, I know Matthew uh, sees a lot of, you know, athletes with plantar fasciitis and they come in and some acupuncture treatment with some massage and uh, some turmeric ginger patches and they're good to go. Okay. Terrific. Um, Dr. Mel, for you, first signs of heart disease, please. And 60% of the time, it's sudden death. That's the first sign? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's I know. I know. It, it's, it's really, people don't realize how um, serious heart disease is. I mean, you know, 60% of people just simply keel over as the first symptom of their heart disease is sudden death. Now, for the rest of us who survives that, um, no, let, let, let me just put it this way, right? Heart disease still kills more guys than, than, than gals. I guess first thing. Secondly, heart disease still kills more people than any other disease, okay? Including cancer, diabetes, and all the other disease. So nothing, you know, again, there's something that is very preventable. So um, shortness of breath, dizziness, um, and uh, chest pain. Of course, these are obvious symptoms that you should like get yourself to the doctor. Uh, but, but if you sort of look and, you know, everyone should know their family history. Do you have heart disease in your family? The grandpa, grandma, uncle, aunts, mother, father, anybody, brother, sister, do they have heart disease? They, if they do, then you probably have a slightly higher risk because genetics does comprise about 15, 20%. Uh, of the risk factor. And the other risk factors are, what's your cholesterol like, right? Because high cholesterol, especially the LDL, the bad cholesterol, will, in, coupled with inflammation, high C-reactive protein and other kind of inflammatory markers means that you will have more plaque. So the plaque builds up and that plaque, and it's like clogging the arteries. And then at some point, the artery gets so clogged, there's not enough blood flow to your heart muscles and the heart muscle will you know, stop pumping. So you get a cramp. Um, so that's the obvious heart, heart attack. Now you have other kind of electrical problems with the heart, such as uh, atrial fibrillation, as an example, uh, you know, um, tachycardia, fast heartbeat, uh, or slow heartbeat, bradycardia, and different kind of uh, electrical issues, uh, you know, needs to be dealt with and taken care of. Uh, as well as um, valve problems, right? So there, these are doorways inside the chambers of the valve, as well as um, you know the going out into the uh, blood vessel. And these valve can uh, prolapse or get damaged. Uh, sometimes it's hereditary. Sometimes is post-viral infection. So again, you you have to just be aware that it's it's something that. Um, uh, just have, have your check up on a regular basis, check your cholesterol, diabetes can increase the risk for heart disease and um, high blood pressure can put additional stress on the heart. So there's a number of factors that you need to look at. But at the end of the day, uh, for guys, heart disease is a big, big risk, big. 
And so make sure you do annual physical. Don't skimp on that. And uh, check your blood pressure on a regular basis. You know, Matthew brought up a good point. Like if you have a way of measuring and get the data, it's hard to ignore, right? So if you're taking a blood pressure, let's say regularly every day, and you're starting to see that it's going be beyond 130 up on the top range and above 90 on the bottom, you got high blood pressure and you should do something about that. So see a doctor, but maybe instead of getting on a medication, you can you know talk to the doctor and say, hey, uh, would you mind monitoring me while I you know lose weight, while I change my diet, lower my sodium intake, learn how to meditate uh, and see an acupuncturist because all of the things that I just mentioned can help lower your blood pressure naturally. So again, if you can do it naturally, if you can take control of it instead of going on medication, because once you're on meds, you're probably going to be stuck on meds for the rest of your life. And uh, so if you can change from a lifestyle standpoint of view and naturally use these remedies, that's going to help you a great deal. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, Matthew, back to you, back to feet as well, but with a twist. Um, so we have a question that in the, we have a, our meditation for pain management CD. And at the very end, it says um, to press the painful area for three minutes on the foot map um, that's included in this. And the individual is saying, what if I can't reach my feet though? Is, can I instead press something on my hand or what do I do? That's an interesting question because um, there is actually um, one way in which we can do acupuncture where you do a mirroring technique where you can press things on your hands in order to release things. So say if this were the heel of your foot, you, and well, I won't show you my foot, but anyway, <laughs> but yeah, so you can basically think of the, the corresponding area on your, on your hand and you can use that. But an easier thing to do if you can't reach is get a tennis ball, get a soft ball, press on it. So you don't, if you can't reach it with your hands, then just get something underneath your feet and then use your foot in order to put some weight on it in order to press on that spot specifically. And if you need to roll it around, that's also a way of dealing with it. The other thing that tends to be used is, um, especially for things like plantar fasciitis and, and other pain related issues, is get yourself a water bottle. Mm -hmm. and just kind of roll the foot over it. Oh, yeah. great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hopefully that's that for that individual. Thank sure. you. Um, and Dr. Mel, one last question for you. Come back. <laughs> what oh, that's, that's right. He has the ball that we actually sell. That's actually fantastic. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> see, see, this is the acupressure spiky ball, right? So it's got yes. all these spikes on there. And yes, I don't mind showing you my foot. And then what I do is, and I, you know, <laughs> I, I actually, I actually step on it and then I massage all those areas and it's tender, right? Or you can oh. use a pebble or you can use um, you know, I mean, again, use your creativity, you know, get something that is, uh, you know, a, a, a smaller protuberance and just press, you know, step on it. So anyway. That makes me think Lee and I are going to start reaching for our spiky balls again, too. <laughs> oh, actually, <laughs> it's very have comfortable. As well. yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, Dr. Mal, last question for you from an individual. What would be, because you wrote this whole book about longevity, what would be your advice for somebody in their 20s? versus somebody in their 40s? All right, so uh, for those young uh, whippersnappers out there um, in your 20s, so um, first and foremost, start early. It truly, you know, if you think about it, aging <laughs> begins in your 20s. I mean, you know, you, you, will, you will realize that by the time you get to your 30s, you're just not as vibrant, strong, healthier, you know, have as much energy, your brain doesn't work as well. I mean, you know, so, so even if you feel like I'm in my 20s, I'm invincible, you know, that's the time to really start planning out. Um, ultimately, I will tell you, after so many years of working with centenarians, interviewing them, and looking at all the research, I will tell you the one secret. Hmm. And uh, because people ask me all the time, like, okay, you have 360 tips in your book. Can you just give me like the one, you know, cliff note version, just the most important one. 
And? and it's like, no, you need to read my book. And oh. you need to read the whole book. No. <laughs> so of course, I mean, all of those tips are important. But the one thing that I actually did not put in that book, which is this. Hmm. Good habits. Good habits. If you have good habits, most likely you will live to be 100 without even trying. I'm serious. They have good habits. And uh, so that's it. You know, if you have a habit of like walking instead of driving, if you have a habit of taking staircases instead of elevator, if you have a good habit of eating lots of vegetables and fruits instead of red meat and, uh, you know, a high trans fat diet or something like that, if mm -hmm. you have a habit of being grateful in the morning when you wake up and smile at everybody you see and uh, calling your mother uh, to, you know, uh, every day to check in, make sure you do that. It's really important. But your dads too, you know, because dads need, you know, like some encouragement too. Um, you know, and if you, if you have a good habit, really every day, that includes going to the bathroom. Don't forget that is a very important to have that constitutional habit every day. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'm talking about is if we look at people who have lived a long time and remain very healthy is that just look at their lifestyle. They, they repeat the stuff they do every single day, mm -hmm. all the good habits, all the good habits. They take walks, you know, they go to sleep at a certain time every single day. They wake up at a certain time every day. Um, they have good habits. So start acquiring good habits in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s. It's never too late. Start now. Okay. Thank you very much. Matthew, what would you like to conclude with for tonight? Uh, listen to what he said. I mean, I can't emphasize that enough. I mean, the earlier that you start, the, the better, but it is, it isn't ever too late, um, to make a change. I mean, if you're, if you're 60 years old, even if you're 70 years old and you're starting to decide, you know, I need to change the way in which I'm living, you know, then make that change and, and create some good habits. I mean, it actually doesn't take very long to, ingrain something into your daily routine. I mean, give yourself a couple weeks of maybe some hard work, especially if you're stubborn, which happens for most of us men, where we tend to be pretty stubborn. So spend a couple weeks working on yourself. And then if you figured out that thing that really works for you, you know, you're, you're waking up feeling good and you're, you're exercising and you're eating well and all those things, then yeah, then you're looking at a healthier life, but also listen to yourself. Um, you know, pay attention to yourself and, and be comfortable with yourself and don't worry about whether or not you're manly because you are. <laughs> it ultimately doesn't matter, but at the end of the day, yeah, you, you are manly enough and being manly also involves being aware of your feminine side as well. So. Okay, thank you so much. Well, you guys have done amazing for our first male-oriented topic all about men tonight i loved it i hope that our audience really enjoyed it as well so thank you thank you for this and um we will be this will go into replay immediately following this episode on our facebook page and then uh we will do a repost of it for youtube at the end of the month um also speaking of months we're about to jump into july next week and guess what you get to come back again with us on monday with dr mao we are going to be chatting about the five elements and nutrition. So he's got all sorts of great, um, very specific tips related to the five elements. Uh, so we hope you'll tune in for that on Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific with us. So thank you once again to both of you and enjoy a wonderful night, everyone. And we will see you next week. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you.